Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, Revoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hey, Eric. Thank Good you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. I told him you would yell if anybody's phone went off. So <laughs> <laughs> I have done that before. So I made sure I silenced coming. mine before I came out. Yeah, I, so I, I, I actually, I had mine on this morning. My kid called me. Thank God, or I would be the guy whose phone went <laughs> off. Thank you, first of all, for coming. My and pleasure. I want to start with a question I've asked everybody um, who's running for president. When you've got a former president, a former vice president, a former U.N. ambassador, current governors and senators, why should voters vote for Chris Christie for president? I think two reasons. First is that I'm tired of our country over the past decade or a little bit more doing small things. We're dividing ourselves up into smaller and smaller groups. We're pitting those small groups against each other. And then we're bringing up issues, not that are unimportant, Eric, but are small in context of how big and important our country is and has been. And I'm not interested in doing that. There are too many huge problems for us to deal with of consequence that I want to take on and I'm willing to talk about now as president. You know, first is education. When one of every three children in this country does not read at grade level, that is a crisis, everybody. It's a crisis. And we have been absolutely dominated by the teachers' unions in this country. And if you didn't know it before, and I've been fighting this, as you know, since 2009 in my state. But if you didn't know it before, you saw it during COVID. Those unions put those kids and their families clearly second to their own parochial concerns. And that's added to that one in three number. We need to revolutionize what we're doing in education. And I'm going to give a speech on this after Labor Day, but we're going to go for educational freedom in the extreme. I want every family in this country to have an educational freedom account. We spend $800 billion a year in this country on K-12 education. And we're getting mediocre results as a res- uh, uh, despite that money. I want every parent in this country to decide where their kids go to school. You have a great public school, send them to the great public school if that's what you want. If it's not, if it doesn't support the values you want or give the kind of education you want, find a good private school or a parochial school, a renaissance school, a charter school. But parents should be making these choices, Eric. And to me, that's one of the biggest issues that this country has to confront over the course of the next decade, or otherwise, we are going to have an uneducated populace, which is awful for our competition around the world, but also awful um, for our democracy. Because an uneducated populace can't be an active participant in our democracy and in governing ourselves. Um, Second, um, we have a political problem that needs to be solved by someone serious, and that is our government spending. Our government spending is completely out of control. It was under, out of control under Obama. It was under, out of control under Trump. And it's even more out of control under Biden. It created this inflation that is damaging every family in this country and has been for the last year and a half. And I dealt with this when I was in New Jersey. When I became governor, I had an $11 billion deficit on a $29 billion budget. And every Democrat, I had a Democratic legislature, every Democrat thought we got him. He's going to have to raise taxes. It's the only way to solve this problem that we created for him, by the way, by all their crazy spending before I got there. And instead, we sat down and went line by line through the budget, literally, not just the rhetorical. Mm -hmm. And we eliminated 863 programs. And we balanced the budget without raising taxes and kept it in balance for the next eight years. Now, when I did that, my, my popularity numbers went down because every one of those programs has a constituency. But you have to be willing to give those numbers up for something of consequence and bringing our state and its budget into balance and not raising taxes on some of the most overtaxed people in America to begin with was incredibly important to me. Third, 
crime. As Eric mentioned in the introduction, I, I was the U.S. Attorney in New Jersey, which is the fifth largest U.S. Attorney's Office in the country, for seven years. And I know how to run a prosecuting office, and I know how to pick people to run them. And when you have the violent crime we have in cities throughout this country right now, it is decaying those great cities. And a great country without great cities will not be a great country for long. When you think about the business, the entertainment, the culture, and the education that happens in big cities, if we let that go and people won't go to these cities anymore, um, it's unacceptable. And it's unacceptable morally to me that people are afraid to walk the streets, to go to the supermarket, to go and pick up their dry cleaning because they're scared. And so if, if these you know, liberal prosecutors in these cities are unwilling to prosecute this crime, which they are, I will appoint an attorney general, and my first instruction to him or her will be the federal government will prosecute those violent crimes in those cities until the cities wake up and do it themselves. And we'll have plenty of room in federal jail for those violent criminals, because if we don't clean that part up and have law and order in this country, it, it absolutely undercuts the social fabric that we have with each other. And fourth, um, and final, um, uh, because I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do not believe that America can continue to be the great country that it is by filling the moat and pulling up the drawbridge. We have to engage positively with the rest of the world. The thing that's made our country different and stronger throughout its history are two things, our freedom and liberty at home and our friendships around the world. Countries like India, Vietnam, folks in Eastern Europe, want to be friends with us because they know that we're not trying to impose anything upon them. We just want them to enjoy freedom and liberty the way we do and a great economy the way we do. But if we don't stand up for our friends, Eric, what's going to happen is they will be friends with China and Russia and North Korea and Iran because they need to be, they're smaller and they need to be friends with someone. I want them to be friends with us because that's what's always made us different. And I want to stand up for those things in the world that matter. Two weeks ago, yesterday, I was in Ukraine. And I will tell you for certain, everybody, this is not a territorial dispute. What they're doing, the Russian army, under the direction of Vladimir Putin, is barbaric. I went to the city of Bucha. I walked with the mayor through streets where he showed me the homes where the Russian soldiers went in, pulled the men from those homes while they were alive, gouged out their eyes, cut off their ears, then tied their hands behind their back and shot them in the back of the head in front of the rest of their family, and then went into those homes and raped all the women that were in those homes. Now, America will not permit that, nor should we permit that to be happening in the world to a friend who's a democratic country. Second on that is this. This is a proxy war against China, everybody. China is funding the Russian effort by buying their oil. China is coordinating the uh, obtaining of sophisticated weapons, not only from China, but from North Korea and Iran, for the Russians. And I have to tell you something. We have folks in this race who have called Vladimir Putin brilliant, a great leader, and just yesterday, Donald Trump called him the, that he was the apple of Putin's eye. I have to tell you the truth. I don't want to be the apple of Vladimir Putin's eye. I don't. I'm telling you that right now. I don't want to be. And so a Christie administration would stand up for our friends around the world and work with them. We would expect friendship in return. Um, but those are big things, consequential things. And I don't think you hear a lot of other people talking about those things in this race. And when I couldn't hear anybody talking about America, that's why I got in. Because we have to have those conversations as a country, and we have to move on to someone who's actually done this and knows how to do it. And that matters, too. And we've seen that with Barack Obama, someone who had no idea how to run the government. And we see it now with Joe Biden, who doesn't remember how to run the government. (laughs) 
So I, I want to go back to your first point, because uh, I remember when you became governor of New Jersey and there was first the rah-rah celebration Republicans of one in New Jersey. And we're like, ah, yeah, but what sort of re- Republican? And you immediately started fights with the teachers unions in New Jersey because the schools were so far behind and everybody, myself included, kind of perked up and like, oh, this, this guy kind of gets it. Uh, you, you, the teachers unions hated you. Yes. And, and yet you were able to put points on the board in New Jersey. And it, we see this situation now with, with Randy Weingarten and others now trying to, to, to gaslight everyone and saying, well, it wasn't the teachers unions who wanted schools shut down during COVID. It was, it was the Trump administration. It was the Republicans who wanted to shut schools down. Complete baloney. And you know that. Look, we saw it. She was writing the plan inside the White House because they now have a teachers union member who goes to bed every night with the president of the United States. That's a pretty good lobbyist to have, everybody, let me tell you. And and she, Jill Biden, is a teachers union member and was advocating those policies and gave Randy Weingarten an open door. Now, in New Jersey, as you just mentioned, we opened more charter schools in New Jersey during my eight years than any governor in the state's history, and those charter schools are still open. We established Renaissance schools, which were partnership schools with private sector. The private sector would come in and fund the building of those schools. And then, and they did it on a charitable basis because they cared so much about education. And in the city of Camden, where we had six of the 10 lowest performing schools in our state in one small city, a mile square, what we did was took over the, took over the school system there, the governor did. We um, came in. We got private sector partners. They built Renaissance schools. What's happened in the 10 years since we did that? In the 10 years since we did that, the reading scores have gone up over 65% for those kids, and the math scores have gone up over 50%. We are changing lives. Those are kids who are now going to be able to be functional citizens in every way, economically, politically, and as leaders of their families. That's going to be a great thing. And and as far as Randy Weingarten goes, and she'll hate to admit this, but we so badly beat down the the popularity of the teachers' union. When I got there, we did a poll. The popularity of the teachers' union was at 78% in New Jersey. By the time I got done with my first year, their popularity was 38. And how did I do it? I went around the state and did town halls all over the state and asked them some very simple questions. Do you pay for your health insurance. Everybody in the room would raise their hand. I go, not only do you pay for yours, you pay for 100% of every teacher's health insurance in this, con- in this state. Do you have a pension that will pay you enough in the first two years of your retirement that you will have exhausted everything you contributed to it, and then for the rest of your life, the taxpayers pay for it? No hands went up. I said, you do that. I said, now listen, I'm okay with providing health care and pension to people, but it's got to be fair, and they've got to contribute to it too, and they've got to do their jobs. And, and, I, and I just would not stand by and allow it to happen. So finally, in the city of Newark, which was also a terrible place for education, I got Randy Weingarten to voluntarily agree to merit pay for teachers. We're, we're still to this day paying teachers who perform better in Newark more than the other ones. That's another step towards getting teachers to be competitive and want to do better because we give them a financial incentive. We're, we're, we're a capitalist country, for God's sake. Everybody should be incentivized by being paid more for doing better. And those are the things we did. And, and that's why I think I'm best positioned to revolutionize this across the country and use federal dollars and the bully pulpit to urge states that don't want to do it to get in the game. Because otherwise, there's going to be a parental revolt in this country about kids who are being underserved by an education system that we pay a king's ransom for. You mentioned crime. I, I, I don't want to talk about that RICO case. I want to talk about another RICO case. I know you know RICO. Mm-hmm. We have a situation here in Atlanta, for those of you not from the state, uh, it's a police training facility. The Antifa members have come in and taken over the land. We know they're being funded just based on, on their own statements by outside nonprofits, one of which Stacey Abrams on the board. They have firebombed a youth facility in the city. 
They firebombed businesses. They firebombed a, a, um, a, a fire department. They have shot at police officers. They've booby trapped trees. It is stunning to me that in a day and age when the Biden administration says we need better trained police, the city of Atlanta is committed to building a police training facility. Antifa activists are shutting it down, and there is, to my knowledge, no federal investigation at all into the coordinated effort. Somebody's got to be paying the living expenses of these kids from New Jersey and New York and Washington State who have come down. Of the 50 people who have been arrested, two are from Georgia. Look, this is why we need an attorney general who will do three things with every matter that comes before him or her. To prosecute matters without fear without favor, and without partisanship. And I, folks in New Jersey will tell you, I spent seven years as the U.S. attorney right before I became governor. So I had a lot of opinions about prosecution and a lot of experience at it. When I became governor, I appointed an attorney general and I got out of her way. And what I said to her was, don't call me about any criminal case. I don't want to know. I used to hate when politicians, when I was U.S. attorney, used to comment on the investigations I was doing because I knew they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> and the best thing, by the way, about being U.S. attorney, the way I did it was, people always ask me this all the time, what's the best part of being U.S. attorney? I said, the best part is only I know what I know. <laughs> and that's an advantage. And that's an advantage we have to bring back. These prosecutions should be confidential. They should be done without fear, favor, or partisanship. And something like this that's going on in Georgia, the U.S. attorney in Atlanta should be all over this. This is multi-jurisdictional in terms of the people who are perpetrating these acts. This is what the federal prosecuting system was made to deal with. And absolutely, it seems to me, and I don't know every fact, but the way you're presenting it to me, RICO seems particularly appropriate in that circumstance, given that you obviously have an organization here that's uh, racketeering and is corrupt. And that's what RICO stands for, everybody. Um, and so we need to be more aggressive about this. And look, the best example I can give you about as an elected official, how I'd be with law enforcement, was we'll go back to the city of Camden. When I became governor, it was the most dangerous city in America, the highest murder rate in the country. And I went to the police unions and tried to negotiate more police on the street, less behind desks. Let's get out there and try to fight this. And the unions told me, go away. So I went to my chief counsel and said, we should fire all of them. He said, well, what are you talking about, Governor? I said, fire the entire police department. He said, on what basis? I said, they suck. That's what basis. <laughs> It's, it's the most dangerous city in America. Their job is to make it less dangerous, and they're obviously failing. So they went back and looked at the laws, and they came back to me. And they said, well, you probably have a 50-50 shot to win if you fire all of them at once. I went to the county, which is also controlled by Democrats, and I said to the county government, I'm willing to do this, and to the mayor, I'm willing to do this, I'm willing to take it on, I'm willing to pay for it. But county, you need to develop a new county police department with a metro division that will police Camden, and I will negotiate the contract for how we do it with them. I'll pay for it and negotiate it if you let me do it and support me, Democrats. They looked at me and said, Governor, if you have the guts to do that, we're with you. We fired them, the entire 320 members, all of them. We established a new police department for the same amount of money, Eric, that we were spending on the 320, we got 450 new police officers. We trained them in community policing and violence de-escalation. And now, 11 years later, the murder rate in Camden is down 75%. And when George Floyd happened in a city like Camden, which is 95% black and brown, there were no riots, there was no violence, and the protest march was led by the African-American pastor of the largest Baptist church in Camden, and by the white Polish-American police chief. They stood at the front of the parade and marched to protest against that type of violence. If you know what you're doing and you have some guts, you can do this. 
But it's more than just talk, everybody. You got to know how to do it. And we haven't had a president, in my view, since 2008, who's actually known what they're doing. And it matters. It's not fun time anymore. We've got to elect somebody who knows how to use the levers of government to get things done and who is unafraid to both confront the other side and then cooperate with the other side. Because if we don't do both, we'll continue in stalemate and we'll continue to just drift. Let's move into some foreign policy. When I had you on my radio show a while back, we spent a lot of time talking about China and it comes up with this crowd, but in, in particular, the top issue when I asked people to submit questions for everyone, and it was questions for you and it, literally for everyone, was our military preparedness to confront China. And there is, as this has come up in some of the conversations we've had on stage, you have the Biden administration telling everyone who can hear that we're out of bullets, we don't have enough missiles, uh, and there is this real concern. But as a corollary to that, it also feels like a lot of our politicians on both sides of the aisle are trying to cash in on the system and get out before China becomes dominant. Um, it, the rats fleeing the ship, so to speak, not trying to save it. I mean, it, if you would just, just talk about your perspective on that. Look, I think you, you need to know the specifics on this to really be able to talk about it. Where we are most desperately underprepared is in our Navy. We do not have the number of ships we need to have. We do not have the number of submarines we need to have, and they are not modernized to the extent that they can be. The great advantage that the American military has had against China has been our nuclear submarines. They're quiet. They don't know if they're there or they're not there. They are an enormous, and they can deliver both nuclear and non-nuclear lethal blows to an opponent. And we have allowed, since Barack Obama, we have allowed that submarine force to deteriorate. We need to reinvest in it because now we're not looking at a land war in Russia anymore. The Russian army has shown their inability to beat Ukraine. I don't think they're looking to pick a fight with us tomorrow. It's China. And the way we're going to deter China from being aggressive in Asia is to have those submarines deployed and those ships deployed in the South China Sea and have them be an effective deterrent to Chinese aggression, to convince the Chinese that the juice is not worth the squeeze if you decide you want to be aggressive. And let me be clear, I'm not giving away Taiwan to China. Not now, not five years from now, not 10 years from now. And it's not about an economic deal Yes, it matters that they produce a great number, two-thirds of the semiconductors in the world. And that's important strategically and economically. But it's not just that. We need to stand up for people who want freedom. And if we let the Chinese do that kind of domination game, because we're unprepared or unwilling to deter them, then they will not stop there. And we've seen this act before. And so... That's one area where we need to do better. We also need to modernize our Air Force. And this is where Boeing needs to be held to account. You know, they have not done a good enough job. They are way behind on the next um, uh, stuff that's already been authorized, the next class of fighter jets. They are way behind on that. Um, and, you know, they're not getting any penalty for being way behind. I'm fine to partner with the private sector. We must. In order to do it, we have one of the, we have the greatest private sector in the world. But when they fail, and sometimes they do, there needs to be penalties for that failure. It can't just be an open, you know, taxpayer checkbook. We pay you if you give us what we ordered, and we pay you if you don't. Well, that's not the way it works in my world, and I'm sure it's not the way it works in yours. And so we have to get better in terms of our procurement. We need a secretary of defense who is smart, experienced, and tough. And there's a few good candidates on our side of the aisle that would be a Christie Secretary of Defense who I would say, go over and do two things. I, I will give you the money to modernize your forces if in return you show me that you're having accountability for procurement and we're getting what we paid for. I'll pay for it, but I will only pay for it if I get it. And then we can use it as a deterrent with China. So I'd say those are the things. Our, our naval forces, both our ships and our submarines, and we need to modernize our, our fighter aircraft. Do you think there's a sentiment in Washington, probably bipartisan, that 
that, well, China's on the rise and we can't stop them, so let's just get rich off the system beforehand? Yeah, I think there is, and that's because most of them are stupid. That works. <laughs> okay. They read only what their staff puts in front of them. And because they've never had to run anything, everybody, remember, God love members of the House and Senate. They play an important role in a branch of our government that needs to be there for accountability and oversight and to be responsive to the will of the people every two years or every six. I'm not calling for the abolishment of Congress. But what I am saying is they don't know how to run anything. The only thing they've ever run is a congressional office or a Senate office. You know, when you're a governor, I had 60,000 employees in New Jersey. And I, people used to ask me, what's the scariest part of being governor? And I used to say, 60,000 people have letterhead with my name on it. I'm not sure what they're doing with it every day. <laughs> and, and so, you know, your job is to do what you can to make sure that they're accountable. Here's what's going on. China is on the precipice of a 2008 style economic downturn. They have overborrowed, they've overspent, they've overdeveloped. And, and it's running out. I, I am promising you, everybody, if we have competent leadership in the White House, I would not trade one of the cards in my hand as the American president for one of the cards in the Chinese hand. They've overspent their economy. They are having an enormous problem with the aging of their population and no one coming up to replace them. The one-child policy in China is now coming back to bite them. They don't have a next generation of the volume that they had before. So economically, they can't keep up with growth. They don't have people to fill the jobs they need to be able to do it. And the oppression in that country will always make people feel less willing to sacrifice. I would not trade our position for China's for a minute. The people who are doing it, and they are, and trying to cash in, as you said, appropriately, to go there and, 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 and get out before it gets bad, guess what? They're going to miss the next great American story. And that's fine, because we don't need them anyway. We'll get some people who actually believe in this country and believe in our future. And going back to that first question you asked me, the overarching reason, I gave you all these specifics, but the overarching reason I'm running for president is because I believe in this country's future if we have competent leadership. And I want my children and God willing someday my grandchildren to be able to have the same great American life that I've had and that you've had. And that isn't a given, but it's right there in our grasp if we have competent leadership to do it. I, it yeah. I, I've had this sneaking suspicion that, you know, Ronald Reagan knew the situation of the Soviet Union was perfectly willing to bankrupt them. And it's like China has thought they could do that to us. And it seems like they were on the verge of success, except as you mentioned, and there have been very few people to point out these, these stories that have come out lately that the Chinese economists are no longer allowed to talk about the Chinese economy. <laughs> uh, their stocks are no longer allowed to be sold for financial businesses in the last week. Youth unemployment is no longer revealed in China as of last week. Uh, it seems like they tried to bankrupt us and they've come close but yet they've done it to themselves. But on our side, we do have $32 trillion in debt, yeah. and it's about to exceed GDP. That's why I said what I said about spending. Now, look, when I was in the race in 2016, we had a candidate who said, I'll balance the budget in four years. Let me promise you right now, I'm not balancing the budget in four years. The hole is too big to be able to do it. And it would involve either massive cuts to entitlements plus, ma plus massive increases in taxes. I don't think we need to do that. We just need to show the trends going in the other direction. And over time, with a growing economy and discipline on our spending, we'll get there. But we've dug, look, Obama, Trump, and Biden have dug us too deep a hole. I mean, Trump added six and a half trillion dollars to the national debt in four years. And Biden is going to exceed that. I mean, look, everybody, this is a bipartisan problem. We, have, we had a Republican Congress 
for the first two years of the Trump administration. And we didn't do it. And so we've got to come to grips with that and understand what that means. And so, yeah, we do have a big problem with that debt. But we can turn it around different than the Chinese for two reasons, because we're going to continue to grow this country from a population perspective. And we're going to have workers there that are available to fill those jobs. And secondly, an absolutely free society knows these things. We know we have 32 trillion in debt. We know when we have difficult times in our economy. We know when the Washington swamp is being, um, you know, fed. We have a free press. We don't always like them, but we got them. And we have a free society. The Chinese don't know. And a society that is in the dark is a society that is not one that is going to win the war of ideas with the United States. But we have to be competent, everybody. This is not a TV show, okay? This is real. This isn't fun and games. This is real. The problems we have are real. I haven't even talked about entitlements yet. But I'm happy to. Because if we don't deal with that, that $32 trillion in debt is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the most disgusting part of Joe Biden's State of the Union address this year was when he stood up and he said, We'll all agree, right? We're not going to do anything to Social Security. And both sides got up and cheered. A group of liars and cowards. Because they know. They know that in 10 years, Medicare will be bankrupt. And in 11 years, Social Security will be bankrupt. And what the law that Ronald Reagan passed 40 years ago requires is if that happens, it is an immediate 25% cut in benefits in Social Security and in Medicare. I think it's 26% in Medicare. I want you to imagine, for those of you who are on Social Security right now and depend on it, and for those of you who are looking towards it, what would it be like to cut that benefit 25% in one fell swoop? There would be people in this country who wouldn't be able to pay their rent or their mortgage, wouldn't be able to buy food, wouldn't be able to heat their homes. Cataclysmic stuff. So we got to have this conversation. And other than me, nobody in this race is willing to talk about it. It's ridiculous. And so the difference between us and China is we will be able to talk about it. And in China, the, the next time that the citizen of China will know about this will be when the anvil drops on their head. And that's not the kind of society we want to have. And it's not the kind of society we want dominating the rest of the world. So I can be rather dense and I don't get subtlety, but I can take a hint. Let's talk about entitlements. <laughs> this, this is why he has a top rated program, everybody. <laughs> So on that issue, though, you know, I remember during the Bush administration, 2005, he gets reelected. He immediately says, we've got to begin to do something about entitlement reform in the country. It's going to bankrupt us. Republicans, Democrats both freak out. Uh, if we had implemented his plan in 2005, the rates of returns for Social Security recipients today who are retiring would be more than double what they are right now. And we didn't do it. Very much like the whole, well, we shouldn't drill in Anwar because it'll take 10 years to get the oil if only we had started 10 years ago. It's amazing how Congress works. What is your idea for reassuring current or near-to-be retirees while also looking to the future? Look, I think what President Bush proposed was brilliant, but turned out to be politically too ambitious. And the country heard partial privatization of Social Security, and they freaked out. And not only did Democrats reflexively oppose it, but Republicans got scared by it. So let's put that off to the side for a moment. And let's talk about under the structure we have now. There are three levers to this, everybody. Eligibility, right? There is age and taxes. Those are the three things. There's nothing else. There's no kabuki magic to this. And so I don't think taxes should be on the table because I think that our taxes are already too high. 
And I don't think we've done nearly enough to try to be inventive on the other two to come back to the American people and say, take the cap off Social Security taxes, increase the rate. I'm not for those things. But let's say for I have a son, my oldest, who is about to turn 30 in six days. I can't believe I'm going to have a 30-year-old kid, but I'm going to. And if I say to him now, Andrew, we're raising the eligibility age for Social Security. And I say to his 40-year-old co-worker, for you and you, mid-40s and lower, we're raising the eligibility age for Social Security. If they can't plan over the next 30 to 35 years for that eventuality, they got bigger problems than raising the Social Security age. We can't do it to people in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. It's too late for them to appropriately plan. But we can make real savings over the long term by playing with the eligibility age, but for younger people, so they have time to plan to establish an IRA for themselves if they don't already have one, to put more money in their 401k plan if their employer provides it. But we give them time for that. And then I think we have to look at means testing. I mean, look, let's start here. I think we'd all agree with this. I'm sure he's collecting it, but Warren Buffett does not need Social Security. Right? He doesn't. Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Jamie Dimon, they don't need it. So maybe we can start there so no one is offended, okay? All the way up there. And then let's start having the discussion to work our way down. How much accumulated wealth can you have where the government is right to say to you, are you willing to sacrifice some or all of your Social Security to help the person who needs it the most? We ask people to do that all the time in taxes, right, Eric? I mean, look, I have God willing, I never will be, nor have I ever been someone who needed to have food stamps. But I pay for them every year in my taxes. There are lots of things, because people yell at me, I paid in, I want my damn money back. You pay for lots of stuff you don't get your money back for, right? You pay for food stamps, you pay for education that maybe your children don't access. You pay for a lot of stuff that the government provides because we say, as a society, on the social side, we want a social safety net for those who have gone on tough times. And we also want certain things available from an education perspective that maybe we or our children won't access, but we know is good for our country's future. So I think that argument is a little fallacious. And so I think we have to look at those things. And that's going to be an ugly conversation, everybody, but it's akin to what I was saying earlier when I eliminated those 863 programs. If you're president of the United States, you've got to be willing to sacrifice some of your popularity in return for doing something of consequence. And I can tell you this, I, you know, I used to say to my, my folks all the time, my, my popularity numbers in New Jersey, believe it or not, at one point got up as high as 75%. And they always get nervous. The staff would get nervous, like, don't do anything. Things are really good. <laughs> don't do anything. And I'm like, look, I'm not taking these popularity ratings and framing them and hanging them on my wall. I, I want to spend them. This is the time to do tough things. And for a president, it's going to be right after you get elected. You're probably never going to be more popular than that moment. And that's the moment where you have to take risk. And, and it'll be political risk that comes in. President Bush learned that in 05. But I think we have to do this because otherwise it's a 25% cut in 11 years. And I don't want to do that to folks who have no other way to support themselves. So those are things we need to talk about. And we need to have an honest conversation about it. And the only person who can lead that honest conversation in our system is the president of the United States. That's it. And you got to be willing to take the risk. And I'll end with this. I used to get accused of this all the time um, in New Jersey when I would do these things. The press would say, you're governing like you only want to be a one-termer. Talk about this stuff. And I'd say, I, I got to tell you the truth. I don't really care. And they'd say, oh, come on. Every politician cares. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I don't care because I already get the portrait. <laughs> right? I already get, like, they're going to paint a portrait of me and hang it in the state house 
forever. My grandkids are going to come after I am long on the farm and go, Grandpa wasn't always senile. Look at he was. <laughs> he actually did something. Look at this. All we're arguing about is the little brass plaque. Does it say four years or eight years? I am not going to sell my soul for four more years on the little brass plaque. I get elected president of the United States, I'm getting the portrait. It's going to hang in the White House. And what I prefer you to say when I'm done, whether it's four years or eight years, is, man, he had guts and he did real things. And if I get that after four years, you know, <laughs> I'll be just fine. I'll figure something out. And that's what we got to start doing again. And you know, the last time we did this, Eric, was my first vote. My first vote, I turned 18 in September of 1980. And my first vote in my dorm room at the University of Delaware was for Ronald Reagan. When we had problems like this in the late 70s, and a president who seemed completely lost, does it sound familiar? <laughs> and never forget Joe Biden said his favorite president is Jimmy Carter. <laughs> we should have known. <laughs> No offense to Georgians, but thank you. Um, <laughs> we went to a conservative governor from a blue state. And the reason Ronald Reagan was effective was he knew what he believed, he said what he believed, and he knew how to work with the other side. He didn't agree with Tip O'Neill. He didn't love Tip O'Neill, but he knew how to work with Tip O'Neill. And remember, under Ronald Reagan, he got Tip O'Neill to cut taxes. He got Tip O'Neill to fix Social Security and Medicare. He got Tip O'Neill to work on immigration. He got Tip O'Neill to increase defense spending. Think about that. We need someone who knows how to do that again. And I did it for eight years. I had a Democratic legislature every minute of every day of my time as governor. I spent more time with people I couldn't stand than I could count. But they got elected, too. And my job as governor was to make it work. And if you send me to Washington, that's going to be my job as president also. No excuses. Make it work. Looking at the clock in the back. So we, we got about three minutes. All right. And uh, thank you first for spending time. Let me ask you just one more question of, of just being on the campaign trail. Um, the way the media has characterized you on the campaign trail, and it's one reason I specifically didn't want to ask any of you, particularly you, about the former president, is you, you only hear about Chris Christie on the campaign trail if he says something about the former president. Do you, do you get frustrated with the process of, of just how you must run for president now? This, this is the most refreshing interview I've had in the campaign so far because the first six questions were not about Trump. Thank you. And, and then question seven is, why do you talk so much about Trump? <laughs> like, well, well, hell, man, I try to answer your questions, right? I'm not one of those politicians who hears Eric's question, and I hope you could tell that from this morning, and then answers the question with my stump speech. I got one. I'm not giving it to you this morning. That's not what we're here for. I'm not frustrated by the process. Like, that's children complain about that. I answer what I'm asked. And if I'm asked about it, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but if I'm not asked about it, I have plenty of ideas, as you could tell, about what I want our future to be. More ideas than most people you'll hear in this race. And I actually know how to do it, as opposed to some of the other folks who you have heard from and will hear from. Um, so I'm not frustrated at all. I am so happy. I got to tell you, I'm having a second chance to run for president. Let me tell you guys, my dad served in the army during the Korean War. His father passed away while he was there. He came home. The family had no money. He went to work at the Briars ice cream plant in Newark, New Jersey. And it was only because there was a guy next to him at that plant who said, you're too smart for this. Why don't you go to college? He said, I don't need money for college. He goes, dummy, you were in the army. You have the GI Bill. 
go a little bit at a time. My dad went for six years at night to Rutgers in Newark to become the first person in our family to ever get a college degree. My mom never went to college. She worked as a receptionist in an office for most of her life because we needed the money. And I know my dad, who's 90 years old and, and probably watching, because he watches everything. And my mom, who passed nearly 20 years ago, I know is watching from up there. They can't believe that their oldest son has gotten a chance to run for president of the United States, not once, but twice. And so there's no reason for me to be angry or frustrated. I'm not. I'm an incredibly lucky person. And I'm happy every day I'm out on the campaign trail. Now, there are times I get asked questions, Eric Quinn, you know, and, I, and you'll see me respond and I'll get angry. But that's natural. That's human. But overall, I'm really happy, Eric. And I think I've got something to say in this race. And not only about the former president, I got plenty to say. You'll see all that. You've seen it. You know, I'm not breaking new ground this morning. But I do think this. The truth matters. It is not negotiable. It's not. And, and character matters. Because let me tell you, everybody, no matter the, the really good questions, substantive questions that Eric asked me this morning, there's three dozen he didn't ask me that he could have. And there is one of the questions I know you've asked that you didn't ask me, the unknown of the unknown. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do my homework. Um, <laughs> we didn't have time. I was ready. I was ready. But it's a great question because you never know what's going to come across the desk of the President of the United States. You think George W. Bush was prepared substantively for two planes flying into the World Trade Center, a third one flying into the Pentagon, and a fourth one being crashed by its passengers? in Shanksville, Pennsylvania? He wasn't. But let me tell you what he was and is, a man of character. And so I, I was U.S. attorney at the time. I never once worried, not once, whether our country would be well served by that president because I knew him and I knew he was a man of character. We're not going to always agree with him, but we're going to know he's going to make those decisions, not on his own self-interest, but on the interest of the country. How about we do this this time? We nominate someone who we know in our hearts will put the country first and not their self-interest first. We'll put your children and grandchildren ahead of their own children and grandchildren. How about we nominate and elect someone like that and then whatever the unknown of the unknown is, I'll deal with it. Chris Christie, thank you so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank this you. It's really great. Thanks for Thank giving you. me the time. Absolutely. Your questions are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. 